I didn't expect to like John Mark Comer's book, Practicing the Way, as much as I did, given some of the impressions that I had of him. I had recently listened to a sermon he delivered in 2016 on the problem of evil, in which he strongly disagreed with both Augustine and John Calvin and uh, another person in that video, arguing that God doesn't, his will, for example, has can be confuted or paused or prevented by competing wills on earth, and arguing, uh, presumably then, that God doesn't always plan out the future in the way that he wants to. And also his positive use of certain authors that I find less helpful in terms of Christian orthodoxy, like Gregory Boyd or David Bentley Hart. So it kind of made me come into this book thinking, okay, so where did exactly does he come from ecclesially? Is he sort of a, a Rob Bell type? Is he sort of a progressive theological? I, I just didn't know. It was one of those things where my impressions of him were a little bit negative, I have to admit. However, as I read his book, Practicing the Way, I think that I wrongly came into this book. I thought it would be something that it wasn't. In fact, as I read the book, I found myself regularly agreeing with his diagnosis of the way in which many people live the Christian life, where they maybe are just kind of saved by saying a prayer once and don't have a genuine, ongoing, and vital relationship with God in Christ. Comer recognizes that and, and speaks to the issue of how so many millennials in particular, and I guess that's probably his age category, are leaving the church. And he says this is a, a serious problem. And as he tries to diagnose the problem, part of it seems to be that Christians, according to Comer, have more of a transactional view of salvation rather than a view to call uh, to be called to be apprenticed to Jesus. He used the word apprentice rather than discipleship. I think simply just to kind of use his own words and clarify what he means by that. Dallas Willard seems to be in the background there and his rejection of um, his rejection of the transactional nature of Christianity probably has other influences. I'm not entirely sure which ones those are. Um, one comes to mind that I might mention later if I can remember his name. All that to say, okay, fair enough. So this book makes a lot of sense. He says there's a fatal flaw in the version of the gospel that we're regularly listening to. It normally requires you to say a one-time prayer, believe a set of doctrines about God, and attend a church, thereby ensuring that you go to heaven when you die. But it doesn't, he goes on to explain, require a life of apprenticeship to Jesus in the here and now. This is page 21 of his book. This kind of seems to be what he's getting at. There has to be more to this Christian thing than simply just knowing facts. And honestly, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think he's entirely right on this diagnosis that we've had a more intellectual view of Christianity, which is no uh, criticism of those who are maybe are fulfilled in the life of the mind, but that's not really the, the full picture of the faith, nor is it really an historic view. I mean, I was reading Augustine, I think yesterday, who said that Jesus Christ came in the flesh so that he might teach us to live a righteous life. Well, that doesn't feel like a mere, like a, only a transaction of forgiveness, but also a transformation of life, the kind of thing that Comer is getting at. And I couldn't agree more at that level. A number of things, though, in this book, as, as a Protestant, make me think, okay, but his positive view, where is it coming from? What's his view of God? I already mentioned that he has a different view of God than I would have. And uh, who, are, who are the sources? Because I want to know, as a Protestant, yes, we can all agree on the same problems, but our, our resolutions are theological. It means that we are apprenticing to Jesus in accordance with who he is, namely the incarnate Lord, and what he teaches on the basis of who he is, namely theology and Christology are centrally important to the transformed life. But on page 50, he makes a point that he has a spiritual a director who's a Jesuit. Well, he mentions it on page 50, but actually might first mention it earlier. And again, if you have a spiritual life director who's a Jesuit, great, fine, I'm not going to be angry at you for that. But it helps me to locate 
okay, where is his sort of spirituality coming from? What sort of view of justification? What sort of view of God? And seems to be one that corresponds to having a, a Jesuit spiritual life director. So, okay, where does he see himself? And is, is, is Comer then non-Protestant? Is he Anabaptist? Is he jiving with Roman Catholicism, with the Vineyard Movement, with the Quakers? Well, he kind of quotes all of those groups equally um, as sources for spirituality. So it, it strikes me that he's a little bit more just open to reading outside of his own tradition and learning from them. Again, great. That's not really my problem. Well, I'm just trying to understand where who he is and where he comes from. What's interesting is, is we might want to listen to his own designation of himself. And he seems to see himself as a, as a mystic. So he quotes... For example, Carl Rayner, who says the Christian of the future will be a mystic or he will not exist at all. And that's on page 51. And he agrees with that on page 52. And uh, he says, though, just, just to be fair, what I mean by mystic is a disciple of Jesus. This is his quote now. A disciple of Jesus who wants to experience spiritually what is true of them theologically. So... By mystic, he wants to be transformed. He wants to experience, you know, the, the theology or whatever, the inner life of God, as he'll get onto later. And that's all kind of fair and well. Um, I think all of us want that. It's a very good thing. The idea of the sort of stodgy and, um, I don't know, boring faith. I get it. We don't want that. And I have to admit, when he's quoting people in this book, he quotes people who are near and dear to my heart. He quotes Maximus the Confessor. And Evagrius and others who I find are dear and important to me in terms of my spirituality. They are part of that great tradition that I hold to fast. And I think that he is accessing it. But again, I don't always detect that he feels that he is part of it in a sort of dogmatic or at least confessional way. This is interesting. When I looked in his current church affiliation, he had left his um, prior church a couple of years ago and moved to L.A. to Vintage Church L.A. And when you read that website, the website says, we are connected with the Worldwide Anglican Communion through our pastor's ordination, meaning by implication that the pastor is ordained in the Anglican Communion. And so that church has some sort of association with the Church of England, but it's not clear if it's a proper or full connection, whether or not they have the, you know, the liturgy and the confessional stance of the Anglican church, which seems to be particularly important because the website again says that they affirm the Nicene and the Apostles Creed, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles Creed. So they're not really going to the 39 articles or like the book of homily or the book of common prayer that doesn't uh, appear on their website. So I get the sense that at least his church and his ecclesial connections and the way that he describes himself as a mystic, you end up kind of seeing him as um, affiliated with denomination, but not really part of one confessional structure. He maybe is seeing himself as part of the communion of saints who believe in the triune God and so on. And okay, you can do that. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to have some sort of gotcha game here. I'm simply just trying to understand who he is, where he's coming from, and what he's aiming to accomplish. I know a lot of prairie churches in Canada, and other churches, I suppose, across North America, are using his curriculum called Practicing the Way, which this book more or less is like an advertisement, you might say, for his curriculum, Practicing the Way. It's the sort of... Um, book form of what he's attempting to do through his ministry, practicing the way, and then his curriculum that he shares with churches. But again, it strikes me for using this as a denomination or as a, in a, in a confessional setting. I, I just want to ask the question, like, so let's say you're a Presbyterian using this curriculum. Well, do you not have, you know, hundreds of years of reformational spiritual spirituality you can access? And then, of course, the greater tradition prior to that that might fit better. Um, in terms of your view of God in, in particular, because Comer in other places has a view of God that would be at odds with, I think, all Reformed communions. Um, I'm going to write on this later and I'll have more clarity on that. But from what I can, what from what he says explicitly, he rejects the Augustinian and Calvinistic view of God's sovereignty and the, uh, the resolution of evil. So, yeah, that's just something to be aware of. And, and it's possible, and maybe I'm just thinking too technically, because I, I know a lot of denominations and even confessional churches are really just that in name. Um, 
maybe we're just at the point in the, the larger Western church where the majority of churches don't really care so much about confessionalism anymore. And you could have a mystic teach in your church without that really being a huge problem. And frankly, if you think about the New Testament, you do have this tension where you have these, like in uh, Second and Third John, you have these traveling prophets, and then you have elders in a church, and there seems, you know, there could be a tension there. You had apostles and, and pastors. Once you get into the 90s and hundreds of Christianity, you still have the problem of like a bishop in Rome, like or someone like a Clement, and then you have someone like uh, 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 Hermas, this this prophetic character in Rome, and there's tension between those who are part of the structure of the church and those who are at the edge of the structure of the church. This never really goes away. You have bishops and monks in the early church. In the medieval church, you, yes, of course, have priests and monks and different uh, fraternities. You also have movements of uh, Christians who gather together outside of kind of local church structures to start co-fraternities, which are a sort of offside spirituality and, and church-like structure. Part of this is necessitated because a lot of the priests were not actually serving in their churches, even though they were supposed to be. Uh, today, we might say we have nonprofits and denominations, uh, and that's kind of how this tension plays out. And maybe he's just part of that larger tension that will always be a part of the church that Christ builds. There's always going to be structure and those who break through structure. And that might just reflect the nature of how the Spirit works to grows the church and grows the church. Theologically, the book itself um, is, is very practical. It doesn't have a lot of incisive theological comments. I believe that's intentional. He certainly has made those comments in certain, at least sermons of his. And he has a book on the doctrine of God that I hope to read soon, or at least God's revelation of Himself in Exodus. Um, so. I think that's intentional, except for in one place, which is really interesting. I think part of his thesis is we want to experience spiritual, spiritually what we know about God theologically. And so he does begin to talk about um, God as, quote, a community of self-giving love on page 36. He says, we enter into the flow of love within the inner life of God on page 36, become rooted in the inner life of God on page 38. He talks about how our hospitality embodies the inner life of the Trinity and allows us to feel like God. That's the experience language. In another place, he writes that at the heart of the Trinitarian community, we call God uh, is an outflow of generous, self-giving, forgiving love. And again, by a generous life, Comer wants us to, to feel like God feels in his generosity. So there's this notion that in the we enter into the flow of God and to the inner life of God. And we experience, you know, what we say about God theologically, spiritually, through this sort of immediate union to the inner life of God. And given that he's been citing Jürgen Moltmann and, and Eastern Orthodox thinkers, it's it's possible that he's drawing on John uh, Zizulis and Jürgen Moltmann, and maybe Richard Rohr with that flow language, as someone noted to me. And that and that's okay. That's that's there. I I can see that. Um, I have serious revel, uh, reservations about such language. I don't think the uh, Trinity is a community or a society that we necessarily emulate. I think there's a distinction between what God is and what we are. And there's a chasm between uncreated and created that can't be <coughs> crossed unless <clears throat> the word himself assumes flesh in the incarnation but one that we need to preserve <clears throat> because we come to know God through Jesus Christ, who for us and for our salvation assumed human flesh and blood so that he might be like us in every way except for without sin. And so to say that we can kind of experience the inner feelings of God and the inner life of the Trinity in this community of love, which is the three, strikes me as uh, not biblical, not theologically sound, and... Um, Yes, agreeable to a sort of mystic approach, I understand. But there are some things that I would very strongly push back on when it comes to that language. Uh, also, his rule of life is very interesting. At the end of the book, he talks about making a personalized rule of life. It, but it's it's weird because most rule of you know rules of life, whether it's the Augustinian rule or uh, the Benedictine, whatever it is, these rules of life are given by a superior to the membership. And it's one of the important things about this is submitting yourself fully to a rule that is not yours. It is a sort of 
divesting yourself of all that you are and your intentions for the sake of uh, humility and a new form of life under authority and hierarchy. So it's weird to me that he creates a personalized way of life, except, as I thought about it, it's probably impossible to do otherwise. And, you know, like, they're not, we don't have monks anymore in the same way that we used to. I know that we do. There, of course, are Dominicans and so on. But the, the amount and the possibility of the monkish life is, is a lot. It's much more difficult in the modern world than it used to be. And, and as I thought about it, we, we love Jonathan Edwards and his resolutions. I have my own, more or less, rule of life. I guess at the end of the day, given the world that we live in, we almost sort of have to have a personalized rule of life. So maybe that's just the way that he can connect with Western Christians or evangelical or non-denominational. They don't have the drive or ability to join a monastic order, so it has to be democratized. And when it's democratized for Comer, it seems very individualistic, even though I know he's pushing back against that in general, and very <clears throat> disconnected from let's say, a a congregation giving you that rule of life or a church or something like that. Although he does mention the church. It's not that he's against that. It's just, it seems to be offside. Again, it's the prophet-church tension that has coursed through this. I also found it strange that he's all about apprenticing Jesus, being uh, being an apprentice of Jesus, rather, because he thinks it's a noun, not a verb. And while he talks about the name of Jesus over and over, (coughs) very little space in this book draws you to the stories of Jesus in the Bible. They're alluded to, sure, maybe mentioned here or there, but there's no long-form reflection on the Jesus of the Gospel books. Very weird to me if this is a a book about being an apprentice to Jesus. I want to see more Jesus and a little less Comer. That's that's what I would say. This is no knock on Comer. I think he's, again, I should just backpedal one second to say that I think he's a brilliant writer, communicator, He's nailed some of the key problems of lack of rest, transactionalism, uh, a lack of a vital relationship with Jesus. And he's do, I think he's doing his best to lay out a a way to move past that. And I I don't criticize it at all. I'm, I'm with him as again, Augustine said, Jesus Christ came so that we might imitate him. I mean, Peter says this in first Peter that we'd walk in his, you know, footsteps. And uh, this is, key in the Christian. The reason why Jesus didn't just come to the cross is so that we could live a life in imitation of him. I'm not a nihilist. I don't just say you get saved and you want to run away from this life. No, this life is full of wonder and beauty and dare I say mystical experience in the way that at least Comer defines it as um, sort of experiencing spiritually what we know theologically. Yes, all yes, I'm all for that. So I'm not poo-pooing on Comer's writing or identification of the problem. But I but I I think there are some weaknesses through the sort of personalized view of his um, way of life, through his uh, lack of just exposing us to the, the depths of the stories of Jesus, and through his um, view of the Trinity, which is of course implied and not necessarily spelled out here, but given that I've heard him preach before and his view of God is distinctly un-Augustinian and unreformed, at least when it comes to sovereignty and the problem of evil, I, I just, yes, I just want to know more carefully, what is he doing as he's doing this, as he's writing this book? And yeah, I am Protestant, so him having a Jesuit spiritual director makes me feel like, eh, there's probably something there that I that I would not go with. I think that the practical spirituality as laid out in the Reformation and through the great tradition has much to say. And I would be just a little bit more careful than maybe others are to use him in, like, let's say, my church setting. And may I suggest that Protestants have a deep spiritual tradition that we can draw on. And we also have a deep tradition in the, the you know, the, the common tradition of, like, Augustine or... Gregory's Moralia or Bernard's commentary on the Song of Songs. And so maybe part of the answer for us is that we need to look deeper into our past to understand what it means to be Protestant and and to see the deep and robust spirituality there. And that maybe the problem that he describes in this book well, very well, is actually a problem of us lacking a robust Protestant liturgical and spiritual tradition 
and that we've actually given it up for a, a sort of capitalist version of Christianity, one that is full of pragmatism and not deep liturgical practice and spirituality, as many of our forefathers and foremothers had practiced. So maybe it's more that we've forgotten. Maybe we don't need something new, but maybe we need to go deeper into our past. Because after all, the deeper you are into history, the more convinced you are of the Protestant faith. This is all for today. I'll see you next time.